I'm going to start everybody because some of the students have to have to leave right at uh, you know, 2.50 or something like that. Okay, my name is Beverly Strassman. I'm in the Department of Anthropology. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Liz Tibbetts, who's giving the first talk in our series on evolution and human behavior. So Liz did her undergraduate degree here at Michigan. Then she went on and did a PhD at Cornell in neuro neurobiology and behavior. Then a postdoc at the University of Arizona. And then she said she likes it cold, or doesn't like it cold, but came back to the cold anyway and joined the faculty of EEB in 2005. So from her website, it says very nicely what she does, which is Liz studies behavioral evolution, and her research explores how communication systems and social behavior co-evolved to shape how animals look, think, and act. Most of her work is on paper wasps, this is a group of social organisms that's particularly amenable to study because they build open-faced nests where you can watch them. And there's a whole host of other reasons why paper wasps are fascinating and suitable for research. Um, I think it's really interesting. I was just noticing this morning that most of the really great researchers of paper wasps are women. <laughs> they have an association with the University of Michigan. And they grew up in the state of Michigan. And then I thought, oh, duh, I think there's a common theme here. And that is probably, let's see if you know what it is. <laughs> is it um, Alexander? It is. Yeah. It's Richard Alexander, who was my PhD mentor. Wow. So he, he did some of the early work really motivating many of us to be interested in evolution and behavior. And your mentor, Kern Reeves, is. I don't know, a, are you like a great, child. You're, yeah. you're either a grandchild or a great grandchild of Richard Alexander. Um, I guess I'm sort of an offspring, but anyway. Um, so I'm just amazed that after folks like Mary Jane West Everhart, Katie Noonan, even my own sister Joan, had studied paper wasps for years, that Liz came up with this totally new, fascinating and creative direction to take research on paper wasps. I mean, I've just been so impressed by that. And what I particular like, particularly like about uh, Liz's work is just how she articulates her hypotheses, and then she goes out and does really clean experimental work to test them. And these are not you know, little hypotheses. These are big hypotheses that relate not just to wasps, but I think even relate to humans. So I think it's fitting that Liz starts off our series here on evolution and human, including animal behavior, since we are animals. OK, so let me warmly welcome you. Thank you, Beverly. Really, that was a so much. Thank you for the uh, introduction. And thanks for inviting me. I'm so excited to talk to people who study humans and hopefully convince you that wasps are amazing, too. All right, so we're going to start with humans. If you look around the room, you'll notice that humans have incredibly variable faces. So all humans look different. And the fact that our faces are so unique is really essential to our social communication system. Just imagine what life would be like if everyone looked the same. <laughs> it would be a crisis, right? How would you differentiate between your friends and your students and your family members? You just wouldn't know who was who if everyone looked identical. So variation is essential to communication. With that in mind, today I'm going to talk about some paper wasps that have highly variable facial patterns that they use for social communication. And I'm going to talk about how they use their faces and hopefully convince you that paper wasps can tell you something about cognitive evolution um, based on their facial patterns. So before I start, though, I'm going to go way, way, way back in time to when I was a graduate student and tell you about how I got interested in wasp faces in the first place. So I went to grad school being interested in cooperation. A really interesting thing about paper wasps is that they are sometimes very cooperative and sometimes not cooperative. So they can start nests either as a single queen who nests alone, lives her whole life taking care of her, her nest, 
without any individuals that join her other than workers. Other paper wasps form cooperative associations, and when multiple paper wasps cooperate, they have a linear dominance hierarchy. The dominant wasp does all the reproducing, and the subordinate wasps do all the work. So you can imagine from an evolutionary perspective, it's kind of a mystery. Why would you ever become a subordinate when you just start helping and you don't get any reproduction? So I was interested in exploring that question. So I uh, went out, and uh, my first experiment, I had to mark a bunch of wasp nests and then observe the wasps interacting. So this is what a uh, paper wasp barking looks like. You can see that this is blue and this is yellow. And I accidentally ended up with a wasp nest where um, the wasps were unmarked. And I watched the video anyway. And as I was watching it, I realized, wow, I can kind of tell those wasps apart even without the colored marks on their backs. Can you tell them apart? No, probably not. It's a little bit bright in here. But if you looked really closely, you might be able to see that this wasp has four yellow abdominal stripes, and this wasp only has one. So I looked at these wasps and I thought, wow, they are more variable than I expected. So I went out the next day, and I looked at them in even more detail, and I discovered that they have a huge amount of variation in their facial patterns. So you'll see there's variation in this uh, central faceplate, the clipias. There's variation in the inner eye. And there's even variation in the, the eyebrow area. So all the wasps look different. And I did some experiments. And I found that paper wasps use these facial patterns for individual recognition. Wasps learn each other's unique faces. And then next time they meet, they don't need to fight. They can just say, oh, hi, Susie. I remember you beat me last week. And there's no reason for us to compete again. So at the time, I was very excited to show that wasps have individual face recognition, because individual recognition is sometimes thought to be a relatively cognitively sophisticated form of recognition, because you need to learn and remember each individual, right? It's not just like, oh, yeah, you're strong because you have a black belt in karate. You need to actually remember what individuals look like and associate it with information about them. So the fact that wasps have individual recognition is cool. But of course, there's a huge range of different sophistication of individual recognition. So you could have individual recognition where wasps know like five individuals, and they can remember them for a couple hours. That would be individual recognition, and that would be cool. And then like kind of on the other end of the spectrum, we have humans. We can remember thousands of individuals for years, and we recognize people across many, many different contexts. So there's this kind of like spectrum of sophistication of individual recognition. So I wanted to learn more about what these wasps are capable of. Um, and first of all, I learned that wasps use individual recognition to identify the rank of all nest mates. So the colonies are pretty small, maybe like 20 individuals on a nest. And they know every individual on the nest. And they know how they fit into the hierarchy. They also uh, use individual recognition to learn about competitors during contests off nests. So before wasps start a colony, they go through this period where they fight with many, many rivals. And I'm going to talk more about this period later. The consequence is that they're constantly interacting with lots of other individuals and fighting with each other to figure out who's strongest. And during this period, wasps can learn about each of their competitors uh, individually, and they can maintain that memory for at least a week. So they learn about other individuals through a lot of direct interactions, when they fight with others. But when you watch wasps interact, what you'll notice is that they actually spend a lot of time watching other wasps fight. So you know, in this picture, these are two wasps engaged in a dominance interaction. And then there's that individual there who just looks like she's just watching. So I wondered whether wasps could actually learn about other individuals by observation alone. And as you probably know, learning about others via observation is very important in many, many uh, kind of more advanced species. Primates excel at learning by observing others. And even fish can do it. And the idea is learning uh, by watching other individuals can really increase the sophistication of your social knowledge. So not only are you just paying attention to who you fight with directly, 
you also pay attention to a wider network of interactions and how everyone else is interacting with each other. So I thought it would be really cool if wasps could learn about each other by observing contests. So we set up an experiment to test this. And this was an experiment done by two amazing undergrads, Ellery Wong and Sarah Vanello. And the way we set up the experiment is we had some wasps fight. And then we had some wasps who were separated from the fighters who ju could just observe, but couldn't actually uh, directly interact or fight. And this is what the experiment looked like. You can see it's incredibly high tech. So we have a couple wasps who are they're engaging in an aggressive interaction here. And there's one observer who's really paying very close attention to what's going on, and then another observer who's not observing at all. <laughs> so we ran lots of these trials. Um, and after this first stage of the trial, we had a second stage. So in some trials, we had a fighter who was then paired with someone who uh, observed her fight. And in this situation, social eavesdropping is possible. So the observer could have watched what the fighter did during the contest, and then the observer could change her behavior based on what she saw. And then over here, we have some controls. So in the controls, we have a fighter interacting with an observer, but she's interacting with an observer who had not seen her interact. So this fighter is interacting with an observer who watched a different contest. So these controls are good to account for other things that could go on in a fight, like winner-loser effects or bystander effects. Now, if there is social eavesdropping, you would expect to see a difference between cases where the observer actually saw the particular wasp fight versus cases where the observer did not see the particular wasp fight. So first, I'm going to show you data from the control. And you can see observing of aggression of a different rival does not influence behavior. So if you see a fight and then you're paired with a different individual who you did not see fight, it doesn't influence your behavior. So what that means is there are not really strong effects of winner-loser effects, and they're also not bystander effects, where watching any fight influences your behavior. So next we can see results from the experimental trials where bystanders uh, were allowed to interact with the fighter that they saw. And what you can see is that if a fighter was really aggressive during a trial, when the bystander finally got to interact with the fighter, that bystander tended to not be very aggressive. But on the other hand, if the, um, the fighter was very, uh, not very aggressive at all, then the bystander tended to be very aggressive in the future. So what that tells you is the bystander is paying attention to the fighter, She's watching the fight. She's saying, wow, you were super aggressive. You look scary. So I'm just going to give up without even fighting with you. So this shows that wasps can learn about other individuals via observation alone. And we measured a few variables in, these, uh, in this experiment. And what we found is 75% of variation in aggression of the uh, bystander was attributed to information she got during social eavesdropping. So that's how aggressive the fighters were, the dominance rank the fighter attained, and honestly, whether the bystander was actually watching during the fight. So I was totally uh, shocked by this result because I thought social eavesdropping might occur in wasps. I thought it would be cool if it did, but I never expected it to have such a strong effect on uh, behavior. So accounting for 75% of variation in the wasp behavior tells you that eavesdropping is likely to be a really important part of a wasp's social life. So around the same time, um, we found that wasps are capable of something called transitive inference. So transitive inference is using what you know to make inferences about what you don't know. So if I tell you that A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, those are things you now know. And I ask you to make an inference about the relationship between A and C, you can probably guess. Do you think A is bigger than C? Yes, look at you. You guys are such smart humans capable of transitive inference. So um, policities are capable of transitive inference, and they're the first uh, non-vertebrate to be shown to be capable of transitive inference. So I think that combination of social eavesdropping 
and transitive inference really suggests that wasps are living in a complicated social world where they, you know, they pay attention to not only who they interact with, they can learn about others just by watching fights, and then they can make guesses about how strong or weak wasps are based on uh, the information they observe. So, you know, the combination of these results suggested to me that the wasps are much more socially sophisticated than I expected in terms of keeping track of social uh, interactions. So, of course, the next step is asking the question about how wasps use these abilities in the wild. You know, all this was done in the lab, which is great, very well controlled, but how do, what's their social network like in the wild? And uh, the particular context that we were interested in is social partner choice. As I said at the beginning, when wasps first come out in the spring, they spend a few weeks flying around and checking out potential social partners before they settle down in a relationship. And these are all females, so it's only females who are interacting with each other. I'm not going to talk about males at all. Males are totally boring. They just mate and die. There's nothing interesting about them. No, there are a few interesting things about males. But we're focusing on partner choice in females. So wasps are assess lots of different rivals, and then eventually they settle down in these cooperative associations. And we wanted to know how do they make these decisions and what factors are important in determining who they should spend their life with. So this is a project that was done by Emily Lau, an amazing uh, grad student in my lab who's now graduated and gone on to a postdoc continuing to work on the same project because it's so amazing. And then our collaborator, Noah pinter woolman who's helped us uh, with some social network analysis to try to understand the WASP interactions in uh, more detail. And the way the project works is we have this giant tent at the botanical garden, and that allows us to watch WASPs as they choose partners and live their lives. And so we're interested in both the process and outcome of partner choice. So this is how a wasp's life works. So in the spring, in May and June, wasps are shopping for partners. They're checking out different individuals, and then they finally make a choice and settle down. And then after they settle down, they form a colony, usually in, late, uh, in early June and July. They form a colony, they work together, they take care of their offspring as a group, and there are all sorts of interesting on-nest interactions they have at this time. They engage in cooperative and competitive behaviors on the nest. And then at the end of the season in August, all the reproductive wasps are produced, they, they go off and disperse, and we can study how big their nests are, how successful the wasps actually are. So we wanted to study what kind of uh, characteristics of individuals influence the kind of choices that they made. And we were um, interested in personality. So wasps have repeatable individual variation in personality. Some wasps are more active and exploratory than others. Um, they also have repeatable variation in their social personality. Some wasps tend to be really aggressive in many situations. Other wasps tend to be more affiliative in different situations. And of course, the wasps also vary in body mass. So this project was designed originally to look at how a wasp's personality and size influence the kind of uh, cooperative decisions they make. But of course, I'm completely obsessed with individual recognition, as you know already. So I just, we decided to also measure uh, the wasp's capacity for individual recognition. And there is variation. So every wasp in this population is capable of individual recognition, but some wasps are great at it, and some wasps are more mediocre. You can think of it as kind of parallel to humans. You know, some of you go to the first day of class, and you instantly remember all 30 individuals in your class with a problem. Other people, you know, it takes a kind of a few weeks to remember everyone. So there is you know, variation in human face recognition capacity, similarly variation in wasp individual recognition capacity. And we tested wasps individual uh, recognition using training. So we basically train wasps to, dis to differentiate between other wasp faces. Some wasps get 10 out of 10, some wasps only get six out of 10. And we've done a few experiments to show that how well wasps do in this training setup 
actually reflects their ability to learn and remember other wasps. So we measured all these variables about the wasps, and much to my delight, it turns out that individual recognition is actually incredibly important for the wasp's success. So what we found is that one of the things we found is that wasps with higher individual face learning were more successful. They actually build larger nests and have more offspring. And this is true when you look at all the wasps on a nest. And it's also true when you only look at uh, um, you assign relatedness to only the dominant wasp on the nest, who gets most of the reproduction, and solitary wasps. So this, uh, by only looking at dominant and solitary wasps, it's kind of a better measure of reproductive success, because over here, we're giving subordinates uh, some reproduction that they probably don't actually get. We're working on quantifying exactly how many offspring each individual has uh, at the moment, but for now, we can assume the dominant wasps gets most of the reproduction. So I was completely shocked to see that across multiple years, wasps that are better at learning and remembering individuals also were more successful. They have higher reproductive success. And this result suggests that there are selective benefits associated, associated with being able to learn and remember uh, individuals, um, and that social competence might be beneficial in wasps. So this kind of advantage for individual face uh, recognition was really exciting. But of course, we wanted to know more about why. Like, what is it about wasps that are better at individual face recognition that could possibly account for their higher fitness? What makes them more successful wasps? And part of the answer is that it looks like wasps with higher individual face learning have more stable cooperative associations. So across both years, they tend to uh, spend more days on a nest together. And this is possibly because they're better at managing their social relationships, they have more stable relationships, and this leads to higher reproductive success. Another part of the, the story might have to do with their interactions on nests. And I know most of you have not seen paper wasps in action on nests. I'm so sorry for you that you have, have missed out on that. So I'm gonna show you what it looks like on a wasp nest. So you can see that most of the time wasps are very lazy. So they just sit there not doing anything. Honestly, most animals are lazy most of the time. But then they get activated. So there you can see that's the dominant wasp. And she just did a behavior called darting where she moved very rapidly at another wasp. And that's kind of how they activate things. So you can see now everyone's running around in a tizzy, darting at each other, getting all worked up, trying to get something done. They stick their heads in the nest cells, and they use that to figure out, you know, are the larvae hungry? Do they, they need food? And over there in the corner, you can, maybe you can see that the dominant wasp is engaging in some pretty atten, intense aggression onto a subordinate wasp. She's kind of like chewing on her back and like hitting her with the antenna. So she's convinced that subordinate wasp to go off and forage through all of her uh, aggressive interactions. And there, the subordinate goes and works hard for the colony. So this uh, is a result we only found in one year. So, you know, interesting. But one thing we did notice is that uh, high individual face learning was linked with more of these darting behaviors, at least in one year. And considering how uh, complex on-nest behavior is, I was really shocked and pleased to see that there was this interaction. It suggests that at least in 2021, wasps that are more um, better at individual face recognition might be better at coordinating the behavior on the nest and activating behavior at important times. Now, of course, it didn't turn out to be true in the other year, so we got to figure out what's going on. Another part of the answer for why wasps with higher individual face learning might be more successful is that wasps with higher individual face learning also shared more food on nests. So in a, in a wasp colony, there's a lot of sharing. They regurgitate food into each other's mouths. They share chunks of caterpillars with each other. And that's the most cooperative thing a wasp could do. And what you can see is that wasps that are better at face learning 
also are more cooperative. So this suggests to me that the ability to learn and remember individuals um, is linked with multiple aspects of a WASP social competence. Their ability to match their behavior to the current social environment and kind of get the most out of their colony members. There is no link between uh, individual face learning and aggression. So it's not, it's not that WASPs that are uh, better at learning and remembering individuals just interact more or are more aggressive. We see a very specific relationship with more cooperative behaviors, like being on a stable nest or regurgitating food to each other. Okay, so, so far I've talked about how social knowledge influences a WASP's success. So WASPs have a much more sophisticated social world than I initially thought when I started studying them, where they interact with many other individuals, they keep track of other individuals, and their ability to form these um, individual relationships seem to be seems to influence their success. And wasps with a greater ability to learn and remember individuals have higher reproductive success. They also have more stable nests and are more food sharing behavior on, on their nests. So overall, this is a really striking evidence of a selective benefit associated with individual face learning. Wasps who are better at individual face recognition are more socially successful. Now you all know that there's been lots and lots of work trying to understand why some animals are smarter than other animals. And there are lots of different answers to that question. There are lots of different components that go into um, what influences the evolution of cognition. There is a lot of work showing that living in an ecologically complex world where you have to do a lot of challenging foraging can make uh, influence animal cognitive evolution. Um, but there's also a lot of evidence and a lot of interest in the role that social interactions play in the evolution of cognition, particularly the idea that the challenge of keeping track of individual relationships can influence cognitive evolution. And animals that live in more socially complex worlds often have larger brains or excel at cognitive tasks compared to animals that live in less socially sophisticated worlds. And there's a lot of really interesting evidence for this from species comparisons, where people will test brain size in a range of different taxa and correlate it with um, their social success. So there's pretty good evidence that social intelligence influences cognition across many, many species. Um, but of course, species comparisons, you know, there's some limits to the conclusions you can draw because there are so many different things that vary between species. And uh, species comparisons, it's hard to control for everything. There's also some really interesting evidence within species that social intelligence might be associated with cognition. And this is kind of the, the one study I know of and Ashton did in 2018. And it's a lovely study where they looked at magpies and they found that magpies in larger social groups show enhanced cognitive abilities and greater reproductive success than magpies in smaller social groups. And this was really exciting because people said, wow, this is maybe some within species evidence that um, being in a larger social group, which is maybe more socially complex, is associated with cognition and success. Now, unfortunately, the challenge of studying something like a magpie is they live lots of years, and it's hard to figure out the direction of those relationships, right? So, um, so it's hard to know how much magpies are good at these tests because they've lived in a social group um, and it's a plastic response rather than something inherited that selection can act on. But nevertheless, I think that this question of whether uh, social complexity influences cognitive evolution is a really exciting one. And one of the reasons, of course, I'm so excited about the fact that wasps that are more uh, intelligent have higher success. And one of the questions that people really wonder about in this, uh, this study of cognitive evolution is to what extent does cognition evolve in a very specialized way versus a more generalized way? So a specialized way for social intelligence would be guessing 
If you live in a complicated social environment, you're going to be amazing at social tasks, but maybe not amazing at anything else. Like if you got a, a WASP report card, if we had specialized social learning, we might say, wow, being good at individual face recognition is really important for social success. But WASPs don't need to be that good at other things, so maybe they're real dunces when it comes to color learning or cognitive flexibility. On the other hand, if we think that cognition evolves in a more generalized way, then we might guess that the challenge of keeping track of these social relationships has influenced all the aspects of WASP cognition. So not only are my WASPs with individual face learning excellent face learners, maybe they're also excellent color learners and excellent reversal learners. Maybe they're just genius WASPs. So we decided to test this uh, question of how much individual recognition and social complexity has influenced cognition in WASPs more generally. And fortunately, we can do that because not every population of wasps is capable of individual face recognition, much to my shock. So in Michigan, the best wasps live. They have highly variable facial patterns that they use for individual recognition. In Pennsylvania, though, the wasps are not capable of individual recognition. You look at the pictures of these wasps here, and you can see there's a little bit of variation in their faces, but they mostly look very similar. And then we've done behavioral experiments, and we've confirmed that they're not capable of individual recognition. You might be wondering why, and that's a great question. And I think part of the answer is that wasps in Pennsylvania are less cooperative. So in Michigan, you get lots of queens joining together, and we think individual recognition is important for that. In Pennsylvania, nests are usually only started by one queen. So maybe you don't need individual recognition if you're less cooperative. So never the, um, you know, it's nice, though, to have this population comparison, because we can see what else is different about Pennsylvania and Michigan wasps. And this is a study done by Juanita Pardo Sanchez, an amazing graduate student. <clears throat> and she decided to compare how cognition differs across populations of paper wasps. So she tested Michigan and Pennsylvania wasps in a range of different ways. So she first trained them to learn colors. And then the next day, she tested their memory for colors. She said, did you remember that blue is good um, without any additional training? And then uh, the, after she tested their memory, she tested their ability to reverse that association. So they learned that blue is good. She would ask them to learn, nope, blue is no longer good. Now yellow is good. And being able to reverse that association suggests that the wasps have greater cognitive flexibility. She also tested how well wasps could learn odors. Um, she tested their ability to remember odors for a week. And then she also tested the wasps on faces. And in this training, every single bit of training was done in this same little box uh, where wasps are trained with electric shock and they get shocked if they're near the wrong stimuli. So very similar training methods. And the first thing she found is that Michigan wasps learn faces more accurately than Pennsylvania wasps. Of course, kind of that makes sense. We showed that there, would be, there was a difference in individual recognition. So it's not surprising that there would be a difference in face learning. And for those of you who are interested in the nitty gritty, we did experiments testing wasps on the faces of their own population and other populations to confirm that it's not just a population effect, like Pennsylvania wasps can't learn Michigan faces or Pennsylvania faces aren't variable enough for recognition. So it's really a difference between the populations in um, their capacity for face learning. OK, how about everything else? Da, da, da. They're not different at all. No difference at all in the populations in any other way. Color learning, color memory, reversal learning, odor learning, odor memory, they're all completely identical. So maybe a little disappointing, but I think also fascinating because it suggests that selection has really been acting on faces alone in these paper wasps. So paper wasps have really sophisticated social knowledge that's key to cooperative success in some populations. And this uh, requirement of individual recognition has influenced the evolution of social cognition in wasps. But there are no generalized cognitive differences. So these wasps are really face geniuses, 
and they're not geniuses overall. And we think that's because it's so important to be able to learn and remember and keep track, keep track of other individuals in their social world. So given that these wasps have these specializations, this specialization for faces, of course we wanted to drill down and learn more about the kind of specialization they have for faces. And one of the reasons for that is that a, there's a lot of research in humans and other primates looking at specialization for face learning. So as you all know, faces are very important for human communication. And humans are better at learning faces than we are at learning anything else. It's so second nature to us that you probably don't even think about how incredible you are at face recognition, but really humans are amazing at it. So I'm gonna show you a, a face really quick, see if you can learn it. Can you find the face? Over there. So I only showed you that face for a second and you could find it, that's incredible. And you're so specialized for faces that if you turn faces upside down, it's much harder. You can probably still see this face down here, but chances are it was a little more difficult for you to find that individual. So here's an even more striking example of how specialized we are for faces. Look at those two faces. Do they look the same? So that's the faces right side up, and you can see that they are very different. Chances are it was difficult for you to see that difference when they're upside down. <laughs> the reason for that is your brain doesn't identify upside down faces as faces. And so the result is it's much more difficult to discriminate fine differences in upside down faces than right side up faces. So we wanted to know whether wasps are specialized for learning faces. And this was a project done by uh, old grad student Mike Sheehan, who's gone on to be an amazing wasp scientist. And we were interested in seeing whether these wasps are specialized for faces with the prediction that if they are specialized for faces, then wasps will learn faces better than they learn any other visual stimuli. So we trained wasps to discriminate faces. We trained them to discriminate patterns. We trained them to discriminate caterpillars because wasps are caterpillar predators. And what you can see is they're much better at faces than they are at the other stimuli. One of the nice things about studying paper wasps is there are lots of closely related species that you can use for comparisons. So we decided to also test this other species, Polistes metricus. So um, Polistes metricus is a paper wasp that's also found in Michigan that does not have individual face recognition. You can probably guess that by looking at how uh, similar those faces are. And again, we think the reason metricus don't have face recognition is that nests are started by a single queen. So you don't need face recognition if you're not cooperative. So we expected if the requirements of individual face recognition have selected for specialized face learning, then species like Polistes metricus that lack individual recognition will also be bad at face learning. So we tested metricus on their ability to learn faces and you can see they just performed a chance. They were terrible at face recognition, but they were, uh, they were pretty good at learning patterns and caterpillars. So you might be looking at this result and saying, okay, fine. The species with individual recognition is better at face learning, but you didn't really give them an equivalent task because metricus are not, they don't really have variable color patterns, right? So actually to do this experiment, we added variation to the metricus faces so that they looked different. And that's kind of not fair, right? That's not an equivalent task. So what we decided to do is we decided to test both species on both their uh, conspecific faces, the sp faces of their own species and faces of the other species. And so this is the data from Polistes fuscatus. And what you can see is they learn their own wasp faces very, very well. This is how well Polistes metricus learned uh, Polistes fuscatus faces. And you can see they do way worse. So Polistes fuscatus really are the face experts. Even more interestingly, Polistes fuscatus learned metricus faces, this, uh, this yellow bar here, better than metricus learned their own faces. So it's not about the specific stimuli, it's just fuscatus are like face geniuses. And uh, this suggests, I think, that there's been selection acting on Polistes fuscatus 
because of that benefit associated with face recognition, which has made uh, their capacity for face learning kind of unique. Now, of course, uh, you know, upon finding out that these wasps were so good at face recognition, we wondered whether it was possible that wasps might use holistic processing for face recognition. So humans use holistic processing for face recognition. And what that means is, instead of just memorizing all the different features in a face, all the features are kind of bound together in a gestalt that's more than the sum of its parts. If you think about what your friend looks like, you don't think to yourself, oh, Joe, I remember Joe, he's got like a giant nose and ears that stick out two centimeters. That's not how we think about human faces. Instead, we think about them in total. So if you look at these two faces here, they look like different people, right? If you look really carefully, can you see what's different about the faces? <laughs> so the only thing that's different is the eyes. Everything else is identical, and they look like completely different people. If you give someone just the eyes, it's much harder for people to see the difference between those two eyes, whereas it's pretty easy to see that these two people differ. That phenomenon is known as the part-whole effect, and that's one of the ways that we know that people use holistic processing for faces. We can, uh, it's very difficult for us to see how parts of a face differ, but when you put that same part within a face, it's very easy to see the differences. And you can compare that with most other recognition that people do, and that's done via something known as featural processing. So if you look at these two houses, can you see that they differ? Yes, it's pretty easy. And you say to yourself, oh, they differ in the doors. That's the very first thing you see. And if I showed you the two doors that differed, you would say, yes, the doors differ. There is no problem with that. So most recognition of most things that we encounter in our life is done via this featural processing. And it's really only faces that are recognized via holistic processing. So it's kind of this rare special recognition. And so people are interested, why has holistic processing evolved? And um, so of course we wonder, do wasps have holistic processing? So we decided if uh, wasps have holistic processing, then we expect that they would discriminate whole faces more accurately than just part of their faces. On the other hand, if they're capable of featural processing, then they would discriminate whole and partial faces with similar accuracy. So what we did is we had uh, we gave wasps uh, pairs of faces, and you can see this two this pair of faces is identical in every way except for the actual face part. So this is the whole face situation, and then we also tested them on partial faces, which is just the middle of the face without the antenna or legs or anything else. And if these wasps have holistic processing, we expect they're going to be much better at whole faces than they are at these partial faces. So as kind of a control, we also uh, tested this other species, Polistes dominula. And I did not talk much about Polistes dominula today, but Polistes dominula have these black spots in the middle of their face that are a signal of strength. Strong wasps have um, bigger black splotches on their face than wimpier wasps, wimpier wasps. And these signal, these are an important signal of fighting ability in wasps. Um, they are not used for individual recognition. So even though these are two wasp species with variable faces, they use their faces for entirely different reasons. With Cuscatus having individual recognition, which requires a lot of learning and memory, and Dominula, they don't need learning and memory to assess their faces. So first of all, you can see that Polistes Cuscatus do actually use holistic processing for conspecific faces. When we ask them to discriminate whole faces, they do great. When we ask them to discriminate inner faces, they fail. They just can't do it. They perform at chance levels. And I think that's honestly somewhat unbelievable because all of the variation in the stimuli is in the center of the face. And yet, when you just show them the center of the face, they can't do it. This suggests that they're using this specialized holistic mechanism and their job not just memorizing features. On the other hand, if you ask a wasp to discriminate a, a polistes puscatus to discriminate the faces of a heterospecific, they do great. 
Full faces, center faces, doesn't matter. They do well. So this, I think that's kind of fascinating because it tells you how very specialized their ability is. They only use holistic processing for recognizing conspecific faces. So this, uh, you know, this convergence in wasps and humans, obviously we're you know, very evolutionary separate. So I think it's fascinating that humans and wasps have both converged on this holistic face processing. And one idea is that holistic processing is very good uh, for allowing animals to discriminate fine differences in stimuli that are very regular. So a human face is very regular. You know, the places it vary, the nose varies, the mouth varies, the eyes vary. The variation is all very constrained. In the same way with wasps, they have very regular faces with very consistent areas that differ, and holistic processing might allow more rapid and accurate recognition that would be possible with um, kind of regular recognition methods. So of course, we, see, we were excited to see that Polistes uh, fuscatus were capable of um, Polistic processing. So we thought we'd test Polistes metricus, to, sorry, Polistes dominula, to see if they also had holistic face processing. And as I said before, they have a lot of, uh, Polistes dominula have these black spots on their face that are used for signaling strength. And what we found is that Polistes dominula do not use holistic processing. It doesn't matter whether you show them the whole face or the center face, they perform just as well. If you, sh if you show them the faces of Polistes fuscatus or their own faces, doesn't matter, they perform just as well. So this tells you that it's not like every wasp uses holistic processing. It tells you there's nothing particularly special about center faces that makes them impossible to learn, right? It tells you that the, the holistic processing you see in Polistes fuscatus is likely an adaptation to facilitate fast, accurate recognition, and it's a very um, restricted circumstance. So far, people have mostly studied holistic processing in humans, primates, and now we've done a little stuff on wasps. But I think it'll be interesting to look at other kinds of stimuli to see how widespread it is. For example, you might expect bees to use holistic processing to assess flowers. You know, maybe there are other circumstances where holistic processing is used that's been overlooked because we're so obsessed with humans and human faces. All right, I was going to talk very briefly about um, viewpoint independent <coughs> recognition, but I'm just going to ignore it because we don't have any time, and I know you guys have to go on to your next class. So to conclude overall, um, individual recognition is key to a paper wasp social success. And the challenges of individual recognition have shaped cognitive evolution in wasps in a very specialized way, rather than causing a more generalized cognitive differences. So thanks so much to all the amazing students who helped do this research. And thanks to you all for your attention. have to leave can, can leave then maybe you could do the piece that you had to skip oh no you're good okay <laughs> come on people have heard me talk so much they All don't right. want to well, hear more you. okay okay general questions you choose okay, okay. any questions yeah this is a very fascinating talk really well, my original point was uh you contrasted the pennsylvania versus michigan law that uh, what effect is the geography of Pennsylvania's like rolling hills in Michigan. But then you mentioned the species of wasp in Michigan, which, uh, so is that species in Michigan specific to a particular part of Michigan, which may have a different geography or? Uh, no, like the question of why some uh, species or some populations are more cooperative than others is a fascinating and challenging question. There are some big comparative analyses that suggest it has, some, has something to do with um, the predictability of the climate with uh, less predictable climates being associated with more cooperation. And people have also done that sort of study in birds. But honestly, like the amount of variation it predicts is so, so small. Um, so I would say we don't really have a very good idea of why that variation occurs. But it is but it's fascinating because there's variation, you know, within a species, between different populations, across different species, and, you know, 
There's a lot to learn about why in the world that happens. Yeah. Is there more genetic variation in the Michigan Fuscatus? in the Pennsylvania? Facility. No, yeah, we did. That's a great question. We did some genetics on them, and it's not like they're inbred. It's not like you know they're they're no, it's not that. We we've done uh, more broad collections, and it seems like um, the further south you go, in the south generally they have less individual recognition, and kind of north and west they have more individual recognition. It's great. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving the talk. I was wondering, following up to that question, do you think over time that uh, these wasps, I guess southernmost wasps, would be able to develop uh, forms of recognition more? Like, do you think this is something that's happened evolutionarily over a period of time? Um, just like out of curiosity. Yeah, my guess is that there's not really as important a selective benefit for individual recognition in those other context, in those other situations. And if you don't benefit from individual recognition, um, it's pretty costly. You got to have a, you know, you, it requires some brain processing power. There are actually some differences in their eyes and their visual perception. So I think you, if you don't need individual recognition, you don't do it. So I think they're not going to evolve individual recognition unless the social context changes. Yeah. I may have missed it, but how exactly did you determine that a wasp is recognizing this face? Yeah, so um, by altering their faces with paint. So we would, uh, the first experiment we did is I changed their faces so that they look different and then return them to the nest. And I found that they were treated like nest mates. Everyone knew they were nest mates, but they um, didn't fit into the hierarchy. No one could figure out who it was. They were like, is that Susie? Is that Joanne? Who is that? And then, um, and then they gradually learned the wasps in her new position. Yeah. Have your group or anyone looked at the variation in brain morphology across the, these more like fish? Group? No, but that's a great question, right? Because one of the questions, like humans, were specialized for faces, and there's a special part of the brain that's for faces that everyone argues about, but most people think that it really is. So, um, you know, wasps have this uh, behavioral specialization. Do they also have a neural specialization? And we don't know the answer to that question. Um, you know, we're kind of trying to study it, but like people don't really know much about wasp brains, so that makes it a lot harder to, to start. I get it. <laughs> do they have a brain or do they have like six ganglia? Or <laughs> yeah, they have a brain. They have this area called the mushroom body, which is, you know, supposed to be for like integrating information. They have optic lobes and visual lobes. And, you know, yeah, there's a lot going on in there. They're pretty smart. They can do a lot of stuff. Well, yeah, but in humans, you have this special face recognition area, which obviously they don't have. Right. Well, they, do. they could. It would just be, I mean, their, their brain is like the size of a grain of rice, so it would be a very small face recognition area, but it's possible. Yeah. I love all the experiments. They're pretty neat. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I would love to know the answer to this that question so, so much. <laughs> yeah. You started out that you could see the side stripes and that started. And all that, is there any evidence that the wasps look at each other's sides or anything besides the faces? Yeah, they do use the side stripes to some extent. Though the first experiment I did showed they use the side stripes, but they pay less, they don't pay very close attention to it. So it has like a quarter the influence on the behavior as the face the faces do. Um, but since then, I've kind of been going all in on faces because they're so much easier to manipulate and do things with. But um, just like you could probably recognize someone by their gait or their hair or other things, I think that it's not only a face situation in wasps, even though faces are most important. Yeah. Yeah. Does their facial recognition ability correlate at all with how well they're fed as larvae? No, it doesn't seem to, although I guess we haven't done that specific experiment. You could definitely imagine that like, if it's a cognitively challenging task and you deprive them, they might grow up to be dumb, and um, that would be a fun experiment to do. I don't expect it would, but you never know. Yeah? In the species that is good at um, individual face recognition, do you know like, um, how much of the variability is heritable? Um, yeah, so it does look heritable. So we're c currently collecting those data um, and we're kind of doing the genetics to figure it out. But the answer is that smart moms have smart offspring 
which is really exciting because if you want to look at the evolution of cognition, if it's an entirely plastic trait, then that's a lot harder. But the fact that there's heritable variation in um, face learning is a lot more exciting for thinking about selection on face learning. Yeah? Do you think there's anything in their social system that has arisen because they developed facial recognition or individual recognition? Yeah, like what comes first, yeah. you know? That's a great question. I don't know, like they do have these really sophisticated um, social behaviors and it's hard to know, you know, which direction it happens. Are they capable of these behaviors because of individual recognition or how much individual recognition is selected for those behaviors? And I think, um, you know, we'd have to do more comparative analyses across more populations to really un understand that, which we haven't done. Yeah. I have a question about those wasps that have the big blotches, if yeah. they're stronger and more aggressive. Yeah. That is, I'm having trouble grokking how that, how that could happen in your biological appearance. Yeah. Does that happen in other species? And how, like, how does that come to be? It's like having like, you know, how many, how many battles you've won on a necklace, but it sounds totally. like logical. Yeah, it's like the animal version of a karate belt. Like you're like, I'm a black belt, I'm a purple belt. Um, it's actually not uncommon. And the reason is because fighting is so important for many animals, but getting in a fight where you could die is very uh, bad. So a lot of animals have these signals of their strengths to kind of minimize the cost of conflict. So like if you look at sparrows, they have these big black patches on their chest, which are a similar situation. Yeah. It's and they, cool. they change over the lifespan, like. Yeah, so that's another interesting part of the, the question. Um, some of these kind of signals of fighting ability are dynamic, so they change as you change. Like a rooster or chickens or roosters or whatever, like their soft parts can be more red or more yellow, and that can change over a very short period of time and basically tells other chickens how good they are at fighting. And then there are other signals, like the spots in the wasp or the black patches in um, sparrows, which are fixed for a while. And, um, and then they're, they're not going to be as reliable, right? Because if you have something dramatic that happens to you, you starve, um, you're not going to be as strong as your signal uh, says that you are. So they're not perfectly reliable, but the idea is it provides enough in information and not fighting is so advantageous that they use it anyway. Yeah. So you mentioned that wasps who better learn individual faces have more successful cooperation and like more reproductive success, bigger nests. Do you find that that's the same pattern if they are more recognizable themselves? If they have more recognizable faces? Yeah, so we try, did an experiment trying to like change the recognizability of wasps. So we painted their faces. So we had groups of wasps where um, three of the wasps looked identical and then one wasp looked different. And what we found is that the one wasp who looked different benefited. She received much less aggression from, um, from everyone in the group. And it's like everyone could be like, oh yeah, that's Susie. And then they didn't need to compete, keep competing with her. Mm -hmm. So there's negative frequency dependent selection favoring rare phenotypes in wasps. And that's um, probably why they have such highly variable faces. And we talked about how a similar thing is happening in humans. Humans have incredibly variable faces, and there's some uh, population genetic evidence done by Mike Sheehan, my old grad student, showing that um, there's been selection favoring rare facial types in humans, because looking unique is so wonderful. Yeah. Um, would you expect the wasp face area to occupy like proportionately the same amount of uh, brain matter as the fusiform face area would in a human brain, or is it more or less? I know, that's such an interesting question. I have no idea. Like, one of the mysteries is when you have such a tiny brain, you know, maybe things work a little different, right? And I have no idea what to say about that, but it would be, it would be really interesting to look and compare. You know, insects are capable of very sophisticated behavior, I think, not the kind of flexibility that humans are. But the fact that they can do it with a brain that's so tiny is fascinating. And how they do it with a brain that's so tiny is really, I wish I knew more about. Yeah. Um, sorry, go ahead, Professor. Uh, so you mentioned um, right before how there's different communities of the same species of wasp. And you just explained, I guess, in one of the graphics that was pretty easy to follow how, I guess, that happens over the course of the year. Um, and I was wondering if there's 
a difference, I guess, in uh, the characteristics or behavior or interpretation of facial patterns across different communities of the same species and how, I guess, maybe that environment could impact what they find uh, or get any informed interpretation. So that for the species with individual recognition? Uh, yeah. yeah. Like in the experiment, did you use all wasps from the same colony, or were they? Oh yeah. Uh, so in experiments, we usually try to use wasps that have never met before because we don't want there to be any sort of um, issues with having met before. Um, but one of I don't one of the things is like in humans, we're much better at learning faces of individuals from our population than faces from other populations. We have trouble discriminating. Um, faces that we don't have much experience with. Um, but we didn't find that in wasps. So they're just as good at learning wasps from their own population and wasps from other populations. And I think that's because um, there is like a consistent set of variants that you find everywhere with wasps. Whereas with humans, I think different populations tend sometimes have more distinct faces. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to ask, uh, where can students go if they want to actually see some paper wasps in Ann Arbor. Just, you know, you go anywhere, not <laughs> with you. I recommend. Um, but they, well, we study them at the Botanical Garden. There are a lot there. They like, you know, things of your houses. Um, we collect a lot at the state park bathrooms. So I suggest you go there. <laughs> there the state park cabins are also lovely. And um, carports, they really like carports. So they are so common, and I'm, they're a menace, which makes them lovely for us because they don't have to feel guilty about killing them. But you won't have trouble finding them, unfortunately. Yeah. How do you keep from getting stung? Um, you you wear gloves, and they can't sting through the gloves, and they're actually not very aggressive. Like most of the time, like they fly away from you. If you're um, attack, if you're going up to their colony in the middle of the day, you we need to wear a head net. But um, I did my whole PhD and didn't get stung once, which is probably, I'm luckier than most. But they're not like honeybees who like sting all the time. Yeah. Well, what's the life cycle of wasps? Uh, what happens to them at wintertime? Yeah, so in the wintertime, the, the wasps that emerge in like August, they emerge and mate in August, and then they hibernate for the whole winter. And then they emerge the following year to start a nest as a queen. And then they live till like August and then they die. And then there are other wasps who emerge as workers during the year and they might emerge in like July and live like two months and then die. So the longest lifespan we're talking about is a year. Yeah. I, I noticed amongst the Pennsylvania wasps, they always return to the same spot to make a nest every year. You have to every year. They're pretty, well, the wasps are pretty, yes. So I would say 20% of the wasps return to the same location and like at the botanical garden if you mark all the queens you know the the, the reproductives one year you can see about 20 percent and then the rest of them disperse and they probably disperse like a mile or two miles but you just can't find them anyway because they're small wow well thank you so much for all those amazing questions